When I'm 80 years old and sitting in my rocking chair, I'll be reading Harry Potter. And my family will say to me, after all this time, and I will say, always. He did not live to see his 80th birthday, but managed to leave behind dozens of diverse, memorable roles. The roles of cold-blooded and cunning Hans Gruber, the depraved Sheriff of Nottingham, the noble Colonel Brandon, the tragic Severus Snape, are only a small part of his creative legacy. Alan Rickman was constantly trying to impose the role of the villain, but in every project he proved that he could play anyone with the same success. Why did he want to quit filming Harry Potter? Who criticized his voice? And what is the secret of his long relationship with Rima Horton? Today on the Biographer Channel, we will tell you the story of one of the kindest, most educated, and talented actors of our time. Alan Sidney Patrick Rickman was born on February 21st, 1946 in West London. His parents were representatives of the working class. His father, Bernard Rickman, worked as an aircraft mechanic during World War II, and then as an artist and decorator. And his mother, Margaret, sang wonderfully, but did not follow the creative path, deciding to devote herself to raising their four children. In addition to Alan, the couple had two more sons and a daughter. These were difficult post-war times. They had to skimp on everything. The family was quite poor, but Alan recalled his early years were happy. He was not deprived of parental warmth and support. Well, if you're loved uh, and cherished by your family, then that's kind of all you remember. Alan's interest in the theater was already evident at that time. He first appeared on stage back in primary school when he was about seven years old. Uh, for whatever reason, I was given the title role in a... See how amazing that it sticks in your mind. The title role in a play called King Grizzlybeard. And, uh, and I remember, actually, I remember my mother cutting out a triangle out of a carpet, and that was stuck on my chin. The happy times lasted until his father died of lung cancer in 1954. Alan was only eight years old at the time and the incident deeply shocked him. The death of the sole breadwinner was a terrible blow for the Rickmans. Margaret had to shoulder the entire burden of responsibility for the four children. It wasn't easy. Alan's siblings were nine, seven, and five years old. Accordingly, they could do little to help the mother, but they tried very hard. According to Alan, they were brought up knowing how to make a fire and knowing how to iron a shirt. Margaret had to find cheaper housing for herself and the children and get a job at the post office. She was a tigress. She could do anything. She had various jobs. She got trained in various others. She always reinvented herself. Margaret remarried in 1960 when Alan was 14, but the marriage lasted only three years. Looking at his mother, Alan realized that he would have to rely on his own strength in this life. Therefore, he studied hard, trying to become the best student in the class. His efforts were not in vain. Alan managed to get a scholarship from the elite London school, Latimer. There was a huge drama tradition, thanks to which Alan appeared in several school productions. However, at that time, he was not going to devote his whole life to this. Rickman was also an active member of the art department. Drawing brought him great pleasure. When, as an adult, Alan was asked if there was a movie that inspired him to become an actor, he replied, I remember the school cinema club was uh, full of things like the Titfield Thunderbolt. By the way, his famous velvety voice was a result of the fact that Alan was born with a jaw tension. This meant that he could not move his lower jaw properly, which made his words sound muffled and indistinct. In childhood, this speech defect even required treatment. Over time, Rickman learned to turn this defect into his advantage. So, his passion for the theater did not affect his choice of an educational institution. Arguing that dramatic art did not seem to him a practical choice, Rickman entered the Chelsea College of Art and Design. Certainly in England, there's a lot of pressure on people to decide exactly what they're going to be when they're 16 and, or even 18. Uh, I had not a clue. Uh, all I know is that with hindsight, um, the art school bit of me got brought back down off the shelf when I started to direct. At the same time, he began working as a designer for the newspaper Notting Hill Herald and wrote articles for the Arc College magazine. 
In retrospect, being at the RCA was like walking across a necessary bridge to the rest of my working life. But the scene continued to beckon Alan, so he joined the amateur drama club group Court. Here, Alan not only got the opportunity to once again show his acting potential, but also found the love of his life. In 1965, at the age of 19, he met 18-year-old Rima Horton, the young woman who was also fond of theater and had been playing on stage since school days. The two quickly found a common language and started dating. For Alan, Rima became the first woman, and as it turned out, the only one. It took a whole 12 years before they decided to live together as a family. While Alan was taking his first steps towards acting, Rima was building a career in politics, and later began teaching economics at Kingston University. In 1977, they moved in together and remained a strong couple for more than five decades. After graduating from college, Rickman, along with his friends, decided to create a design bureau in Soho called Graffiti. The team consisted of designers and illustrators who worked on magazine layouts and illustrations, advertising, book, and album covers. But the organization did not live long. As Alan once said, they learned quickly that they had to pay their bills immediately, but that the same rule did not apply to their clients. Meanwhile, his love of the stage outweighed all other hobbies, and at the age of 26, Rickman decided to enter the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. All I really remember from that time is exactly where the letterbox was in London, where I posted that letter saying, please, can I um, have a form for auditioning? And I absolutely remember posting it. There was an inevitability about me being an actor since about the age of seven, but there were other roads that had to be traveled first. He once said, a voice in the head saying, it's time to do it. No excuses. Rickman auditioned twice to get a royal scholarship because he had no money to study, and he got what he wanted. During his studies, such awards as the Emily Letter Prize, the Forbes Robertson Prize, and the Bancroft Gold Medal got into the piggy bank of the aspiring actor. But it was not without problems. His voice was criticized by his teachers at the academy. Now it's hard to believe, because many are crazy about his unusual timbre. But the fact remains, according to Alan, it took a lot of time in classes to get his diction in order. That I had very lazy diction, that I had a spastic soft palate, and that, uh, as I was saying to you, my voice teacher said, you sound as if your voice is coming out of the back end of a drain pipe. Since he could not completely change his voice, there was only one option left, to turn a disadvantage into his advantage. So Alan did it. Subsequently, he admitted that he had simply accepted what he had. Well, it's what I'm stuck with, so it's not like I can go and get another one. And also, I didn't hear what anybody else hears, so it's always a bit of a shock. In parallel with his studies, Alan earned his living by working as a costume designer for Sir Nigel Hawthorne and Sir Ralph Richardson, famous British actors. Looking from behind the scenes at the stage where his idols performed, he patiently waited until one day he could also be on the other side. But the theater world wasn't in a hurry to embrace the newcomer. After graduating from the academy, he played in small London and provincial theaters for several years, hoping to gain a foothold in the industry. It seems to me that even if you decide to achieve something and train hard, then, in the end, you will still be out of work for a long time. I was no exception. In 1978, Rickman was lucky enough to get a job offer at the prestigious Royal Shakespeare Company, but he didn't stay there for long. The work depressed Alan. It's a factory, he said later. It has to be. It's all about product endlessly churned out, not sufficiently about process. They don't look after the young actors. People are dropping like flies doing too many shows at once. There ought to be someone who helps them develop. After one theatrical season, Rickman, in his own words, ran screaming from the Royal Shakespeare Company. Well, to me it became, you know, there's a, there's a rude definition of acting. I forget which of, which of the English actors it was that coined it, but he called it shouting in the dark. He continued to wander to various repertory theaters, where he honed his skills. At the same time, Rickman tried to play on the small screen for the first time. In 1978, he played the role of Tybalt in a play Romeo and Juliet for BBC, 
and in 1982, he starred in the TV series Smiley's People and the Barchester Chronicles. Despite the criticism of the Royal Shakespeare Company, in 1985, Rickman returned there, but with a specific goal, to play a role that playwright Christopher Hampton had developed specifically for him. It was this role that became a breakthrough for the actor. Rickman played the Vicomte de Valmont in the 1985 production of Les Liaisons Dangerouses, based on the 18th century French novel of the same name. Allen was able to transfix not only the viewer, Hampton said, but he also seemed to have a kind of hypnotic effect on the people he was playing his scenes with. The production was an incredible success, and the predatory and dissolute Viscount performed by Allen was its main decoration. Rickman's co-star, Lindsay Duncan, once stated that audiences would leave the theater wanting to have sex, and preferably with Alan Rickman. He was so good that the audience began to buy posters with the image of his hero in advance. Thus, posters for the performance became an additional source of income for the theater. Her eyes are closing. Every step she tries to take away from the inevitable conclusion brings her a little closer to it. <laughs> Hopes and fears, passion and suspense, even if you're in the theater, what more could you ask? In 1986, the production moved from Stratford-upon-Avon to the West End, and a year later, Allen appeared in his image on Broadway. Rickman's efforts were appreciated not only by the audience, but also by critics. He was awarded with nominations for the Tony Award and Drama Desk Award. The actor also received the New York Critics Circle Award. It was this role that attracted the attention of Hollywood. The actor was noticed and invited to the film, which paved his way to a big movie. Alan Rickman was offered to play Hans Gruber, the antagonist in the action movie Die Hard, just two days after his arrival in Los Angeles. Not everyone knows, but the actor almost refused the role. I read it and I said, what the hell is this? I'm not doing an action movie. <laughs> At the same time, the actor was captivated by the wit of the script and the progressive storyline, which still stands out among other action movies. So he decided to take a chance. At the time when Alec Rickman was approved for the role, he was 41. I got Die Hard because I came cheap, Rickman admitted afterwards. They were paying Willis $7 million, so they had to find people they could pay nothing. Well, whatever the motives of the producers, they did not lose with the selection of an actor for the role of a cold, calculating villain. Despite his lack of experience working on action movies, Meticulous Allen decided to contribute to the development of the character. He thought Gruber should wear a suit instead of the typical terrorist outfit. In addition, it was his idea to add a scene in which Gruber pretended to be a hostage. The actor outlined his proposals to producer Joel Silver. I kind of got the Joel Silver, get the hell out of here, you'll wear what you're told. <laughs> and then I came back and they handed me the new script. By the way, it is very iconic that it was the role of a terrorist that made him famous in Hollywood because the actor didn't tolerate any weapon. Every time he had to pull the trigger during filming, Rickman involuntarily flinched. You can't stop yourself. <laughs> in the end, director John McTiernan was forced to redo some scenes. That is why in the film, Rickman's character shoots a pistol only once. All sorts of people ask me why I wanted to be in a movie like Die Hard. It was a big holiday for me because I didn't have to go on stage every night. It was also something I'd never done before. And I like all that in life. They say that on the set, he flatly refused to throw the heroine Bonnie Bedelia on the floor, believing that violence against a woman was unacceptable. But at the same time, he improvised very often, endowing his negative hero with many charismatic traits. One of the most striking scenes of the film is the fall of Gruber from a skyscraper. Few people know, but the fright on his face is quite real. The fall scene was filmed in the pavilion on the chroma key. And they said to, her, to me, um, well, you know, we could do it on the back of your head and, <clears throat> and we could put a double in, but not your head, the back of somebody dressed up like you said. Mm. Or, and then they started to look very hopeful, or <laughs> we could do it on your face and then, but the thing is that it was so dangerous. Uh, I, did. I just immediately, as an actor, thought, that'll be a good shot. <laughs> Rickman had to fall backwards from a height of six meters on the safety mats. 
It was the last scene I shot in the film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it kills him, we've got him. <laughs> At the same time, the director was afraid that the trick did not scare the actor enough, and the horror on the hero's face would not turn out as natural as they would like. Therefore, he persuaded the team to push the actor, not on the count of three, as agreed. Naturally, Rickman was slightly surprised when he fell down without warning. Subsequently, a couple more takes were made, but in the film we see exactly the one where McTiernan pranked poor Alan. In truth, no one expected Die Hard to be a big success. The initial reviews did not add confidence to the creators either. Willis's brutality, plot, and acting were criticized. Only McTiernan's direction and Rickman's work were praised. However, soon the box office once again confirmed that it was not always worth listening to critics. Die Hard grossed about $140 million, becoming the 10th highest grossing film of the year and the highest grossing action movie. Die Hard made Willis an icon of action movies and Rickman a new star in the Hollywood firmament. The action movie did not claim the status of a cult, but eventually became one. Everything turned out to be organic in it. A vulnerable, comical hero whom you empathize with, a tense plot, and, of course, a smart, charming antagonist. Now, Die Hard is considered one of the greatest action films in cinema, and it deserved it. Do you agree? Have you watched Die Hard, and how do you feel about it? Share your opinion about this movie in the comments. We read everything, and like, the most interesting ones. After participating in the American crime thriller January Man, Alan returned to the BBC starring in the touching drama Truly Madly Deeply. He played the role of a cellist who returns from the other world to comfort his beloved. Passionately, remarkably, deliciously, juicily. Lovely. Deeply. <laughs> deeply! You passed on deeply, which was your word, which means that you couldn't have meant it. Here, his romantic, sensual image was radically different from the image of a tough, cold-blooded Gruber. Throughout his career, Alan will be claimed primarily as an actor who ideally plays the role of villains, but truly madly deeply makes it clear how versatile the actor really was. Do you like playing villains? Uh, did you enjoy those roles? Sure. It was fun. You, know, you get let off the leash and you run around like a mad dog um, for a couple of times in your whole career. In the film, Alan sings pretends to play the cello professionally, wears a charming mustache, and breaks the viewer's heart a little. Not without it. He thought very big, and he had many, many kinds of talent that could address himself to all, all sorts of different parts of the job. So he, he had a lot to offer in every department, really. Truly Madly Deeply received excellent reviews, and Rickman received a nomination for the British Academy Award, as well as the Evening Standard British Film Awards and the London Film Critics Circle. In order to play his next role, the actor went all the way to Australia. There, it was filming of the western Quigley Down Under. The film itself was not original, but Alan's performance was noted by critics, and for his role, he received another award from the London Film Critics Circle and the nomination British Actor of the Year. Close My Eyes 1991 gave him the opportunity to tell a difficult love story again, and then he appeared on cinema screens. <laughs> Cancel the kitchen scraps for lepers and orphans. No more merciful beheadings. And call off Christmas. There was a high probability that someone else would play the sheriff of Nottingham in the movie Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. The fact is that the darker version of the well-known story, although it was a promising project thanks to the participation of Kevin Costner in it, could not boast of a brilliant script. After reading it, Rickman considered the sheriff banal and unfinished, and therefore refused the offer. He did it even twice. Initially, the Sheriff of Nottingham was a kind of silent supervillain who appeared in the frame only to look viciously into the camera or to order someone's destruction through his teeth. After all the other candidates left the project for various reasons, the desperate producers gave Rickman a carte blanche. The actor was allowed to do whatever he wanted with the character. Of course, he could not refuse such a tempting offer. Rickman approached the matter with his usual meticulousness. He resorted to the help of his friends, comedian Ruby Wax and playwright Peter Barnes, to make an interesting antagonist out of his character. The actor said that he once met Barnes at Pizza Express and asked him to review the script. I said, will you have a look at this script because it's terrible. 
and I need some good lines. So he did. And, you know, with kind of pizza and bacon and egg going all over the script. Barnes came up with one of the funniest scenes of the movie. Slithers into the forest. You, Myram, 10.30 tonight. You, 10.45. Bring a friend. And Wax added the immortal phrase, and bring a friend. Director Kevin Reynolds secretly included new scenes in the film. Nobody knew this was happening except him, Rickman recalled. And I knew it had worked because as I cleared the camera, I saw about 80 members of the crew just go. <laughs> and then occasionally, uh, Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, who was being sort of seriously made Marion, she'd come over to do one of the scenes with us. And she said, I want to be in his film. The result was a nasty, unpleasant character, which was nevertheless interesting to watch. Hollywood legends say that Costner even demanded that the director cut some scenes with Rickman because the sheriff was too good and drew all the attention to himself. Even if this was true, the removal of several scenes did not save Costner from harsh criticism in his direction. The film as a whole received rather mixed reviews, but he found a frenzied success with the audience thanks to which it paid off perfectly at the box office, collecting more than $390 million worldwide. This made it the second highest grossing film of 1991. Some critics still liked it. With the same force with which they scolded Costner's game and plot, they praised Rickman. Allen won his first BAFTA award for Best Supporting Actor. Oh, well, thank you. This, uh, this will be a healthy reminder to me that subtlety isn't everything. <laughs> Rickman gladly agreed to experiment with genres. He wasn't afraid of new challenges. In the first half of the 90s, he starred in the neo-noir television series Fallen Angels, satirical mockumentary film Bob Roberts, biographical film Mesmer. For the main role in the latter, he, by the way, received another award from the Montreal World Film Festival. After his success in Die Hard and Robin Hood, Allen was flooded with offers to play new antagonists. But the actor was not going to get stuck in the image of a scoundrel, even though he coped with him by 200%. If you want to fully realize the depth of Alan Rickman's talent and his versatility, try this. First, watch some movie where he played the most unpleasant character, the Sheriff of Nottingham, and then, with a short interval, turn on period drama Sense and Sensibility and everything will become clear to you. The film adaptation of Jane Austen's novel, directed by Ang Lee and written by Emma Thompson, was released in 1995 and captivated the audience. It grossed $135 million at the box office with a budget of $16 million, and is still considered one of the best film adaptations of the writer's works. And for us, this film is also valuable because it gave the world touching shots of Rickman glowing with love in a red uniform and his charming partner, Kate Winslet. His hero, Colonel Brandon, is a typical example of a guy in the friend zone. He is caring and noble, but because of his delicacy and laconicity, he is first lost against the background of another more charismatic, noisy, and young admirer of the main character. Rickman managed to convey the trembling feelings of a mature man who does not really hope to earn the reciprocity of a young, romantic heroine, and nevertheless does everything to make her happy. He tries to always be there, and proves that true love manifests itself in actions, not loud words. Colonel, you have done so much already. Give me an occupation, Miss Dashwood, or I shall run mad. Emma Thompson, who wrote the screenplay and also played one of the main roles, was pleased that Rickman could express the extraordinary sweetness of his nature, as he had played Machiavellian types so effectively in other films. The cast attended movement classes to help them stand, sit, and bow authentically, because in Emma's words, hips hadn't been invented then. Alan Rickman said, you don't just bow, you give yourself to the other person. Kate Winslet admitted that she was terrified of Alan Rickman when she met him. And then Alan Rickman walked into the hair and makeup trailer. I said, hello. Hey, Robert! Hey, She thought he would think she was a terrible actress and get her fired. But the reality, of course, was that he was the kindest and best of men, 
had the patience of a saint. He was a warm-hearted puppy dog who would do anything for anyone if it made them happy. Among other things, a common hobby brought them closer together. During the filming, the Wimbledon tournament was just taking place. When their work schedule allowed, Alan and Kate gathered in the trailer and watched the matches together. Well, as a bonus, a funny and not very elegant story from the shooting. And so I was sort of yanking at my pants, <laughs> and Emma Thompson was standing right there, and I said, oh, fuck, my fucking knickers have gone up my ass. And Al just said, oh, feminine mystique strikes again. After such a successful portrayal of a romantic character, Rickman took 34th place in the top 100 sexiest stars in the history of cinema, according to Empire Magazine. In 1995, another film with Alan was released, An Awfully Big Adventure. Alas, although Rickman and his partner on the site Hugh Grant were unanimously praised, many did not appreciate the dark humor and structure of the story. But new successes were not far off. For his role in the 1996 film Michael Collins, Rickman received his fourth BAFTA Award nomination. Another of his works of the same year was positively received. It was the biographical historical drama Rasputin, Allen portrayed a rebel and a historically controversial personality on the screen, Grigory Rasputin. He was accompanied in the film by Greta Scacchi and Ian McKellen. Allen managed to reveal the image of a multifaceted and complex character, thanks to which the actor was awarded the Golden Globe, Emmy, and Satellite Awards. By that time, Rickman had already had enough experience to try himself as a director. He staged the play The Winter Guest at the Almeida Theater in London in 1995. After that, he directed a film with the same name and plot, starring Emma Thompson and her mother, Felita Law. The film, based on the play by Charmin MacDonald, was warmly received by critics and received awards at various international film festivals. Alan himself was nominated for the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival and received the Audience Award at the Brussels Film Festival. I was going to ask about the different directors you work with. Have you learned different things from all of those directors? I think if you're smart, you learn from all of them, and you watch them thinking, well, I wouldn't handle it like that. Uh, so you learn from that as much as going, well, I'm stealing that. That's the joy of filmmaking. Their works with Thompson did not end there. The actors played detectives together in the 1998 crime drama Judas Kiss. It's been sort of accidental, but I think we're a good team. We play a kind of Taddy, Bogart, and Bacall in this film. Only, Emma's Bogart, and I'm Bacall. Alan and Emma became close friends and more than once worked on common projects. I learned a lot from him, Thompson said. He was the finest of actors and directors. I couldn't wait to see what he was going to do with his face next. She won't like Bastard me. Rickman. Oh. <laughs> I'll have him. Despite being very busy in the cinema, Alan did not forget about the theater. For example, in 1998, he, along with Helen Mirren, played the main roles in the production of Antony and Cleopatra in the Royal National Theater. However, the production received mixed reviews. It was a rare case when critics did not particularly like Rickman's game, but the sluggish reception is quite understandable if you understand the history of the creation of the production. Alan got the role of Anthony literally at the last moment, and only because the actor who originally played the role dropped out due to poor health. Helen Myron recalls, He came in and very courageously jumped in. Anthony and Cleopatra is an extremely emotionally demanding play. He was extremely generous on stage. The play was directed by Sean Mathias, who had no experience with Shakespeare's plays yet, and according to some reviewers, this also affected the quality. Critics also noted that they did not notice any special chemistry between Mirren and Rickman, although you can't tell from the photos that there could be any problems with this. Years later, Mirren revealed in an interview that she was quite intimidated when she first met him. He's a quite imposing looking man. He was tall. He had this incredible large head with this incredible Roman emperor kind of visage and a wonderfully sardonic expression on his face, she said. But despite the first impression, Rickman turned out to be a very sensitive and positive person. When Antony and Cleopatra passed away, he gave a colleague a gift. It was a beautiful old antique bracelet, a little bit broken and just absolutely beautiful. And to quote Mirren, it was so classically Alan. It seems that this was really all Alan Rickman. No matter who of his colleagues is asked what he was like in ordinary life, everyone speaks of him with warmth and respect. He was always great to the other actors during his work in theater. You know he was supportive of other actors, always. 
He was very collegiate and collaborative and loved other actors and loved the whole art of acting. Alan Rickman chose difficult roles, often of ambiguous people, and he was so good in his images that they constantly tried to label him a villain and a muddy type. But in ordinary life, Alan Rickman was different. The reality of Alan inside of that was quite a vulnerable, emotional person, which made him all the more interesting and lovable. He was also very twinkly and kind and gossipy and generous. Alan loved to go to restaurants, to sit and chat, drink some wine and gossip about actors and acting, directors and plays. There was another side to his dedication to his work. Theater director Ian Rickson recalled, he could cut you down to size with a withering remark, make perceptive criticisms more useful than general praise, and be forcefully direct. This, for Alan, was about the level of his engagement, which was committed and principled. To this description, you can also add the words of Emma Thompson. That was the thing about Alan. You never knew if you were going to be kissed or unsettled, but you couldn't wait to see what would come next. If you watch an interview with Rickman and read his diaries, which were published in 2022, you can understand that he also had a great sense of humor. Ruby Wax, whom we've already mentioned earlier, said that at the time when she and Rickman worked in the same theater, she had a tortoise, which Alan jokingly promised to add to some show. In the end, we got Betty on stage during The Taming of the Shrew. Every night when I'd bring Betty on during a crowd scene, Alan proudly watched from the wings, both of us sick with laughing. I take my work seriously, Alan once said, and the best way to do that is not to take yourself too seriously. He played comedy characters no worse than the rest. Just remember the Metatron and the Dogma of 1999. Rickman here is an ironic and slightly tired archangel in a fashionable jacket over a hoodie who loves tequila and makes ironic comments about humanity. I am the Metatron. Don't tell me the name doesn't ring a bell. Rickman agreed to play in the film because he found it highly crafted, highly intelligent, and terribly funny, with the humor putting the seriousness of the themes into perspective. It's a script that makes great technical demands on an actor because there is a real beat to the line, the actor said, and Kevin can hear it. That's what comedy is about, the rhythm of the writing. The actor's casting turned out to be very diverse. Director Kevin Smith said that he specially gathered actors from completely different weight categories to emphasize the contrasts between characters. Alan Rickman is the class of this movie, and he brings to it an air of authenticity. It's also comical to have him opposite Jason Mewes, a Shakespearean-trained actor of the highest order next to a dude from New Jersey. And he was a real sport to wear those 100-pound wings. Jason Mewes, who plays Jay, memorized not only his lines, but the entire script, explaining that he didn't want to piss off that Rickman dude. As a result, it was not Mewes who enraged his colleagues on the set, but Rickman. According to Kevin Smith, Rickman held on to the maracas all day when they shot the scene in the Mexican restaurant. He started driving the crew and cast crazy, playing with them the whole day. Dogma has long been a classic and has become the source of memes and quotes. After watching, you regret only one thing, that Alan appears in only a few scenes. Were they sent to hell? Worse, Wisconsin, for the entire span of human history. In the same year with Dogma, another bright comedy project of Rickman, Galaxy Quest, was released on the big screens. There, he played an actor disappointed in his career, who became famous thanks to a fantastic television series. Raptar's Hammer, by the Sons of Warvan, I shall avenge you. The authors of this funny parody of Star Trek reflect on the impact cinema can have on the viewer and show how difficult it is to be an actor of one role. To some extent, Rickman could imagine the disappointment of his hero. Five curtain calls. There were five curtain calls. I was an actor once. Damn it, now look at me. Look at me! He was a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, received a classical education, and he was well aware of Hollywood's habits of labeling actors and making them prisoners of one role. I remember when Sigourney and I were sitting at the autograph table at the convention, and I remember saying, this is a bit too close for comfort. But there were constant images and moments where you just thought, no, I've lived this. A few years after the release of the film, Rickman admitted that he considered the Galaxy Quest script one of the funniest among all that he had read. 
This was followed by starring roles in the romantic comedy Blow Dry, which was mercilessly criticized, and the more successful The Search for John Gissing, which won the award for Best Film at the 2002 Sarasota Film Festival. The beginning of the 2000s brought Alan Rickman a role that revealed his talent to the younger generation of viewers and forced him to endlessly politely laugh off annoying questions from journalists about a difficult villainous share. We are talking, of course, about the most controversial character in the saga of The Boy Who Lived. I can tell you how to bottle fame, brew glory, and even put a stopper in death. Rickman was not the first candidate for the role of Severus Snape. The producers really wanted Tim Roth to play the gloomy professor of potions, but the actor refused in favor of Planet of the Apes. After receiving the offer of the role, Alan asked Joe Rowling to tell him more about his character, and she revealed a secret that allowed the actor to understand that Snape was more complicated and that the story was not going to be as straight down the line as everyone thought. Because I said to the producers, when I was asked to play it, because you have to remember that only three books had been written when we started filming them. Uh, and I said, I have to talk to her because um, I don't know how to play this part, because um, it seems to be traveling potentially down two avenues at the same time. Um, and so they arranged for us to speak, and um, uh, she, I got through, put through to her on the phone. She was with her sister at the time, and she said, I can't talk now. So that's how close she held everything to herself. And so we arranged to speak the next day when she was on her own. And then she gave me one very small piece of information, which I always have vowed I would never, ever repeat, even though the books are now down and everything. So I, I won't repeat it. When, after the finale of the saga, the fans found out about it, then, of course, they began to offer different versions of what the writer had told him. The actor, in response to numerous inquiries, limited himself to a mysterious phrase about a small piece of information. But it was a small piece of information that let me know that um, there was more to him than met to the eye. Mm. Can you share what that was? No. <laughs> no one except Rickman and Rowling knew the secret of Severus Snape. It is said that all the years of working on the set, Rickman corrected the directors when they asked him to do something that he knew would contradict the true motives of the character. Producer David Heyman told, He had a real understanding of the character. And now looking back, you can see there was always more going on there. A look, an expression, a sentiment. That hint at what is to come. The shadow that he casts in these films is a huge one, and the emotion he conveys is immeasurable. Rickman was very involved in the process of creating the costume and the appearance of his character. The actor told the costumers that the sleeves should be really tight and there should be a lot of buttons. Because that helps me, the idea that he has to do <laughs> that. <laughs> it's actually buttoned in. Uh... And also, as a person with an art education, he could not help but appreciate the work of decorators. I never stopped being fascinated by picking up my wand and poking the wall <laughs> just to check that it really was polystyrene because it looked like a real castle. Obviously, it was precisely because of the magical entourage and the abundant number of special effects in the film that Rickman believed that Harry Potter should be shown exclusively in cinemas. According to him, this was how the film acquired scale and depth. Alan himself, of course, did not take part in the designing of the film, but at heart, he was still an artist. We've already mentioned the diaries he kept for many years. On some pages, he even made charming sketches. There, you can also find his comments about working on films, including Harry Potter. For example, on one of the pages, he writes that too many people are involved in decision-making and grumbles, a hat has been made for Snape. A hat? For Snape? The producers were adamant in their decision to take on the roles of adult heroes of the best British actors, not only because the presence of Britons in the cast was a condition of J.K. Rowling, but also because of the consideration that respected, well-known actors would compensate for the inexperience of children. This trick worked. Adult actors not only improved the quality of the film, but also helped young colleagues to get used to it. 
When Rickman was asked what he likes about working with British actors, he said he loved the approach they take to their work, because they were not as likely to become famous making British films. They didn't have as inflated a sense of their own importance as some American stars could develop. It's like Chris Columbus said, there's not a sense of ego with any of the stars, none of that Hollywood stuff. Everyone just comes in to do their work. Nobody has a cook or a personal trainer. I think everyone found that refreshing. There is no need to describe how successful the Harry Potter film turned out to be. Naturally, the producers decided not to delay the sequel. Just three days after the release of the first part, they began to work on the second one. Allen was not always happy with the creative decisions of director Chris Columbus and the rest of his colleagues, but this did not prevent him from playing his role superbly, causing righteous anger, fear, and awe in the hearts of young viewers. In the recently auctioned archive of Alan Rickman, you can find a letter from David Heyman where he thanks the actor for his work on the Chamber of Secrets. I know at times you are frustrated, but please know that you are an integral part of the films and you are brilliant. Alan Rickman's contribution was important not only in terms of excellent acting, he also helped the young actors on the set and lightened the atmosphere with conversations and jokes. According to Daniel Radcliffe, unlike his dark and cruel Severus Snape, Alan himself was incredibly kind, generous, self-critical, and very funny. It is known, for example, that Rickman gave Radcliffe a copy of The Catcher in the Rye. This cute fact suggests that the actor was really involved in the life of his young colleagues and became a kind of mentor for them. From the Diaries of Alan Rickman, 8.40 a.m. pickup corridor with Dan Radcliffe. He's so concentrated now, serious and focused, but with a sense of fun. I still don't think he's really an actor, but he will undoubtedly direct slash produce. He tried to keep himself in touch with his younger colleagues, even after the end of the franchise. I'm pretty sure he came and saw everything I ever did on stage, both in London and New York. He didn't have to do that, Radcliffe recalled. Tom Felton said that on Alan's initiative, children from hospitals came to the shooting who dreamed of being in the magical world of Harry Potter. At the same time, Alan did not leave the image of Snape for a second. He constantly told the children to refuel, wash their hands, and I realized that our characters are more important than us as real people, Felton recalled. But Rickman could also be strict. For example, he prohibited Rupert Grint and Matthew Lewis from approaching his new BMW closer than five meters. And all because one day, the actors got into it and stained the salon with a milkshake. Alan scolded them, as well as Snape, so they never approached his car again. In the second film, a new unpleasant character appears, Lucius Malfoy. Jason Isaacs, who played him, admitted that when he was offered this role, he almost refused because, according to him, trying to be sinister in the same movie with Rickman seemed pointless. And yet the actor agreed. In person, though, he put paid to my attention on my first day. We were shooting a sequence where we watched and reacted to a Quidditch match. I'm so sorry, Alan, I said. But what's going on? What should I do? No idea, he whispered. Do what I do. Absolutely f***ing nothing. Who knew? The man behind the most distinctive and contemptuous drawl in theatrical history was actually completely accessible, anarchically funny, utterly in the moment on and off screen, and a consumer of music far, far more contemporary than my best of the 70s tastes. A point he made mercilessly in the makeup chair as my cheese fest blasted out. This is how Isaacs described his memories of working with Rickman. With each new film, the tone of the story changed, becoming more and more gloomy. The directors also changed Alfonso Cuarón, who replaced Chris Columbus, brought more mystery and cold shades to the third part of the franchise. Alan Rickman certainly fit perfectly into the atmosphere and was very pleased with the work of the new director. In his diaries, he wrote that Alfonso had done an extraordinary job. Every frame of it was the work of an artist and storyteller. He called the third part a very grown-up movie, so full of daring that it made him smile again and again. From the diaries of Alan Rickman, the day got off to a fabulous start, with the screen guillotining onto my head, a sudden, swift blackout followed by day-long melancholy. Alfonso was quietly ballistic with me. I love him too much to let it last too long, so I wailed off set and we sorted it out. He's under the usual HP pressure, and even he starts rehearsing cameras before actors, and these kids need directing. 
They don't know their lines, and Emma's diction is this side of Albania at times. There was also time for fooling around on the set of The Prisoner of Azkaban, and not only children send with pranks. When the scene where the students go to bed in the main hall was filmed, Radcliffe asked to put him next to a girl he liked. Rickman knew that Michael Gambon, the performer of the role of Dumbledore, had a fart pillow on the control panel, which he actively used. Well, you probably already know what happened next. Our own world. You know, it's completely our own world. And we like to, we like to swim in the deepest waters and fly. They had put a fart machine into my sleeping bag. This whole echo. And Michael Gambon had actually been pressing it during the take, I found out. <laughs> <laughs> but despite the friendly atmosphere on the set, with each new film, Rickman's confidence that he wanted to continue playing in the franchise decreased. Perhaps the reason for this was disagreement with directors and producers, maybe it was fatigue from the frenzied popularity of films, and therefore he was afraid of remaining solely Severus Snape for everyone. We can only assume. Health problems were added to doubts about the role in 2005, shortly before the filming of The Order of the Phoenix. Rickman was diagnosed with an aggressive form of prostate cancer. In 2006, he went to Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, where he underwent surgery. In his diary, Rickman reflected that the pre-op was like a movie set. Nothing seemed real. Despite undergoing surgery, Rickman still agreed to play in The Order of the Phoenix. From Alan Rickman's diary. 30th of January. Finally, yes to HP5. The sensation is neither up nor down. The argument that wins is the one that says, see it through. It's your story. It took some time to establish contact with the new director of the franchise, David Yates, who replaced Mike Newell. Yates admitted that his first reaction to Alan was, wow, he's really prickly and quite unpleasant. But there's a method to his madness. I realized that he has to get in that zone when he's on the set. When I finally met him away from the job, he was a lovely guy. I don't know that he shows that to everyone though. I think Alan is also shy, painfully shy, in fact and he believes his craft should have an element of mystery to it. According to Yates, on the set, Rickman was surrounded by a mysterious and gloomy aura when he put on a black robe and frowned sourly like his character, even when the cameras were not working. Rickman himself admitted that it was on the set of Harry Potter that something strange happened to him. From the diaries of Alan Rickman, I realize as soon as that Snape's ring and costume go on, something happens. It becomes alien to be chatty, smiley, open. The character narrows me down, tightens me up. Not good qualities on a film set. I've never been less communicative with a crew. But those who knew him well enough understood that the first impression of him could be very deceptive. I think a lot of people don't understand Alan Rickman, and I'm not sure I do, said producer David Heyman. But what I can say is that with that voice and that demeanor, sometimes people misunderstand him. He does have a deep voice and he does speak quite slowly, and he speaks in such a way that some people might find him haughty. Nothing could be further from the truth. He's one of the most generous people and most brilliant actors I've ever met. In 2007, the last Harry Potter book was published, which finally freed Rickman and Rowling from the need to hide their common secret. Creative differences with David Yates on the set of the sixth part worsened in one of his notes titled Inside Snape's Head. Rickman expresses dissatisfaction with the way the director approached his character's line. It is as if David Y has decided that this is not important in the scheme of things, i.e. teen audience appeal. And yet, to the delight of fans, the producers managed to persuade him to continue filming. After all, no one could replace him in this role. Of course, Alan devoted his time not only to Severus Snape. He spent about seven weeks a year shooting in Patarian. He devoted his free time to the theater, filming in other films and other small but very bright projects. For example, you can admire his sensual tango with Charlene Spiteri in her video In Demand.
In 2001 to 2002, Rickman once again showed his comedic talent in the highly successful play Private Lives on the stage of Richard Rogers Theatre. In this Broadway production, Rickman and his partner Lindsay Duncan played ex-spouses who accidentally moved into neighboring hotel rooms and discovered that they still had feelings for each other. Rickman received Drama Desk Award and Tony Award nominations for his role. In 2003, he once again reunited on the big screen with his girlfriend Emma Thompson in the tragic comedy Love Actually. The film's director, Richard Curtis, had previously considered Allen for the lead role in his previous film, Four Weddings and a Funeral, but then the role went to Hugh Grant. Therefore, he was very glad that he would still be able to work with Allen on a new project. The structure of the film is peculiar. We are shown nine separate storylines that intersect with each other from time to time, and in each of them we see different manifestations of love. Rickman and Thompson played a couple whose marriage, happy and fulfilling from the outside, was actually bursting at the seams. Through their story, the authors reflect on adultery and what can happen when people, mired in routine, stop spending time with each other and discuss what they care about. Well, because our, as you say, after many years, your, your life settles into something if you're not careful, you're taking each other for granted slightly. Not surprisingly, Love Actually quickly became a classic. After all, in addition to a perfectly balanced script, the film could also boast of a magnificent cast. My strongest memory was when we were doing the shopping scene where Rowan Atkinson takes too long wrapping Alan's illicit gift. Curtis recalled, Almost finished. Almost finished? What else can that be? You're gonna dip it in yogurt, cover it with chocolate buttons? Rowan was taking his time, doing long improvisatory takes, even chatting casually to me about ideas, while poor Alan was acting his socks off in character, angry and impatient, sometimes for 10 straight minutes. It was a great example of true commitment, but also I'm pretty damn sure by the end Alan was actually, quite rightly, extremely angry and extremely impatient. The following year, the biographical drama Something the Lord Made was released. The film tells the story of a black pioneer in the field of heart research, Vivian Thomas, and his complex and unstable partnership with a white surgeon, Alfred Blaylock, who was a pioneer of modern cardiac surgery. The film won numerous awards, and Rickman received Emmy and Sputnik nominations. Rickman has always been interested in politics. The actor once joked that he was born a card-carrying member of the Labour Party. I mean, I will not do a play or a film which promotes right-wing causes. <laughs> By the way, his partner, Rima Horton, from 1986 to 2006, was a councillor from the Labour Party in the London City Council of Kensington and Chelsea. In addition, Rickman was actively engaged in charity work. He was a patron of the Saving Faces Foundation, which explores facial diseases, injuries, and deformities, including various types of cancer. Rickman was also the honorary president of International Performers Aid Trust, a charitable organization that fights poverty among performing artists around the world. He often helped young artists, mentored and supported them. His colleague Juliet Stevenson recalls. He also had an amazing capacity to spot the talent in somebody or spot the direction which somebody could be moving in and hadn't yet and give them the courage to go in that direction or to help young people find their path. He also financially supported his alma mater, RADA, According to his fellow actors, he generously shared his time and money with everyone who needed help. Director Ian Rickson, reflecting on Rickman, once said, He might have seemed, in retrospect, like an icon of the establishment, but let's not forget that Alan came from a single-parent family in working-class Acton. I'm sure these roots gave him this ability to find affinity with anyone who crossed his path, from starstruck autograph hunters to refugees in need of shelter. But let's get back to the movie. 2006 was a very fruitful year. In the sensational psychological thriller Perfume, the story of a murderer, Rickman played the role of the father of one of the victims of the protagonist. After that, Snow Cake was released on the screens, where Rickman's partner was Sigourney Weaver. Alan played an ex-convict who met a woman with autism. Screenwriter Angela Pell wrote the role specifically for him. After reviewing the story, Rickman offered the producers the candidacy of Weaver, with whom he was already familiar from working on The Galaxy Quest. The actress agreed immediately after reading the script. In preparation for filming, Weaver was absorbed in studying autism and consulted with a woman with this disease. 
Alan, on the contrary, decided not to investigate this topic in any way so that his reactions to the heroin would be more realistic. Both Rickman and Weaver were runners-up at the Seattle International Film Festival for their respective prizes of Best Actor and Best Actress. In 2007, Allen was able to show his vocal skills by joining the cast of the musical film Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street. To pound a hotly pyre, what more? What more can man require? In the adaptation of the 1979 musical of the same name, he played the cruel and corrupt Judge Turpin, who ruined the life of the main character. According to Allen, Despite the fact that he was taught vocals in acting school, he had to hire an additional teacher in preparation for the role. And although all the laurels, for obvious reasons, went to the performers of the main roles, Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter, Rickman received a nomination for the Saturn Award for the supporting role. After that, there were roles in not particularly successful films, the black comedy Noble Son and the comedy drama Bottle Shock. It should be noted that Alan often preferred theatrical roles to cinematic ones, and he never took on something he didn't like. I like the risk factor in work. Um, I like feeling a bit unsafe. And theater, of course, is deadly. From 2010 to 2011, Alan Rickman played John Gabriel Borkman in the production of the same name based on the play by Henrik Ibsen. Critics appreciated the actor's work. For example, the Irish Independent called Rickman's performance breathtaking. In 2011, Allen moved from the Brooklyn Academy of Music stage to the John Golden Theatre on Broadway, where he played the main role in the comedy production of Seminar. His character, Alex, is a famous writer and a teacher of writing. He is eccentric, grouchy, and clearly won't be soft on his students. All right, Kate's story, where is it? It's in your hand. All right, uh, what were we talking about? The first sentence. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. When truth is acknowledged universally, it is also universally disdained. I mean, what the f At the same time, The Song of Lunch, a TV adaptation of Christopher Reed's poem of the same name, was released on cinema screens. It was another joint work of Rickman with Emma Thompson, in which they played two former lovers. Is there any form of working relationship you haven't covered yet? Um, well, that we, we're not we an office we relationship. Haven't, we, haven't, we, haven't, we haven't produced something together, which we I think might had, be quite We haven't had children. We haven't done that. No. no. Um, but pretty much everything mm. else. Meanwhile, the filming of the latest Harry Potter films was in full swing. Hogwarts, it's time to say goodbye to two of your finest Defense Against the Dark Arts Teachers. Uh, that is Alan and David Dulles, last day on Harry Potter. From the Diaries of Alan Rickman, 29th of March, last day on Harry Potter. All a bit hard to believe. I think even Daniel was shocked by the finality. Cameras were everywhere. It seemed docu ones. I am asked, so how does it feel before you felt it before the feeling has a name. It's private, I managed, and I'm not sharing it with that, pointing at his lens. Something is in those cans, and it is finished. Thanks, Joe. The film adaptation of the last Harry Potter book was decided to be divided into two parts in order to preserve all the important scenes and storylines. And still, there were arguments. Some moments in the script disappointed Rickman, I get the character development and the spiffing effects, but where is the story?" he complained. But despite everything, the actor tried to give his best. Perhaps one of the most memorable scenes of the first part of The Deathly Hallows is the duel between Severus Snape and Minerva McGonagall. But it could have been completely different. Yates wanted to place against Severus not McGonagall, but Harry himself. But J.K. Rowling intervened. She insisted that everything be as in the books because this was the key moment of revealing the image of Minerva McGonagall. Alan recalled the shooting of this scene with a smile. Thank God for computer graphics, because Maggie and I are having real... Holding a wand is not the most threatening thing. <laughs> and pointing it at Dame Maggie Smith. <laughs> that, you know, you've grown up worshipping from the cheap seats at the National Theatre. Yeah. 
and she's pointing it at you. <laughs> As is often the case with film adaptations, not all scenes were shot in accordance with the canon. In particular, the episode with the death of Severus Snape was slightly changed. Not all fans of the books appreciated that in the film, the scene was not made by the Shrieking Shack, as it was in the original source, but by the Boathouse. According to art director Andrew Ackland Snow, the scenery was changed to give the scene a more dramatic atmosphere and take it out of the already familiar interior, and Rowling approved of this decision. A very dubious excuse, but okay. The method of killing was also slightly changed. In the book, Nagaina did it. In the movie, Voldemort struck the first blow with his wand. Rickman had a lot of questions about this detail, but Yates was adamant, and the actor failed to insist on his own. Here's what Rickman writes about it in his diary. 25th of November, 6.15 a.m., pick up to the flight shed. Cold, wet, droughty, but the crew seems miles away, so Ralph and I can just get on with inching our way towards the scene. David Y., stubborn as ever about Voldemort killing me with a spell. Impossible to comprehend, not least the resultant wrath of the readers. Back home and Rima, narrative brain box, says, he can't kill you with a spell. The only one that would do that is Avada Kedavra, and it kills instantly. You wouldn't be able to finish the scene. Reflecting on the end of work on Partoriana, in an interview, Alan said, It was a punctuation mark in my life every year because I would be doing other things, but always come back to that. And I was always aware of my place in the story, even as others around me were not. Am I sad? The point about a great story is that it's got a beginning, a middle, and end. The end of this story was quite popular and beautifully judged by Joe Rowling and David Yates. So it's not a cause for sadness, it's a cause for celebration that it was rounded off so well. With the last film, it was very cathartic because you were finally able to see who he was. And it was, I suppose, strange in a way to play stuff that was so emotional. So, after saying goodbye to Snape, Alan went in search of news stories, and already in 2012, the comedy Gambit was released. Together with Colin Firth and Cameron Diaz, Alan tried to rethink the old 1966 film. However, it wasn't very successful. Gambit was mercilessly criticized by all more or less decent publications, but who cares when there's a charming scene in the film where Rickman's eccentric hero walks around his office naked? You could hardly expect that from him, could you? In 2013, Alan played Ronald Reagan in the historical drama film Butler and an aging tycoon in the romantic drama A Promise. After a 17-year hiatus, Rickman tried himself as a film director for the second time, shooting the period drama A Little Chaos. The film tells the fictional story of a female landscape designer working for Louis XIV in the gardens of Versailles. It turned out to be quite feministic, if we recall that women of that time could hardly afford such career growth. You know, the central character is a woman that couldn't possibly have existed. Uh, a woman landscape gardener, or a woman with a job. The main character was played by Kate Winslet. Thus, she and Rickman reunited almost 20 years after their common picture, Sense and Sensibility. As for working as a director, he described it as absolutely terrifying. Filming was not easy, according to Rickman. Filming wasn't easy, though throwing Kate into freezing water at 1 a.m., the carriage crash, scenes with 80 extras, tight schedules in venues like Blenheim Palace, it's a constant tap dance between control and freedom. Of course, you've also got pigeons in your ears talking about budget <laughs> and time. And you're shooting it in England, which is a very thin country, and so you're never more than 25 miles from a motorway or if the wind changes, you've got a flight path coming over your head, so suddenly the word cut is happening all the time. But according to him, all problems are solved if there is adequate pre-production, and in the film crew there are professionals in their field who know what they are doing. However, their willingness to support the director in any stupidity can sometimes be dangerous, so you need to be on your guard and push them to cooperate, encouraging them to speak out. I said to my first AD, assistant director, on a little chaos, if you ever see me about to screw up or do something stupid, for God's sake, tell me. So that made it a bit easier. In addition to directing, Rickman also played Louis XIV in his film. When asked what is the difficulty of working as both an actor and a director, he replied, 
<laughs> there are so many challenges to doing that that, of course, originally I didn't want to do it at all. But in the end, economics wins out and producers ram your arm up behind your back and and say, listen, if you play this part, we don't have to pay you immediately. The film premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2014. The reviews were mixed. The work of the actors was mostly praised, but they added that the film lacks pace and plot. What Alan thought about the criticism was unknown, but he said that, as a director, after the release of the film, he certainly felt some responsibility for it. I find myself weirdly, um, you know, you, you go to one screen, and then you might go to another, and you and you, you walk in thinking, gosh, I hope Kate's as good in that scene tonight as she was <laughs> last night. But gradually, with each new show, the actor began to feel that his brainchild was leaving him in a good sense of the word. Alan Rickman's filmography would be incomplete without the projects to which he gave his voice. In one of the episodes of King of the Hill, Alan voiced an extremely harmful king. Rickman's ability to create an arrogant note in his voice certainly made the character the most unpleasant type. He also voiced the depressive robot Marvin in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, whose moody comments certainly graced the film. Please yourself. Here I am, brain the size of a planet, and they ask me to take you up to the bridge. Call that job satisfaction, because I don't. There were also voiceovers of cartoon characters. Help, I'm a fish, the boy in the bubble, and, of course, the caterpillar Absalom and Alice in Wonderland. His velvety voice can also be heard in the video Start a Family by Charlene Spiteri and a half whisper that gives goosebumps as he talks about love. The last feature film starring Alan Rickman was the drama Eye in the Sky, which explored the ethical issues of drone warfare. Do you feel satisfied with your career? Um, would yes and no would be the answer to that. Why you no? Know. Um, because like most actors, I don't enjoy watching myself because all you see is what you've got wrong. Rima Horton went through all the difficulties, victories, and defeats with Alan, who remained his constant partner until the end of his life. The couple could be seen from time to time at various social events, but in general, they led a quiet life, giving no reason for gossip. Alan has always been reluctant to answer questions about his personal life, believing that everything the audience should know about him, they can see in his film and theater works. I want people to believe that I'm the person in the story. I don't want them to be thinking about something or other I've said in the newspaper when they're watching me. Their love story with Rima is often idealized, and no wonder, because they have lived together for more than 50 years. But Rickman always focused on the fact that they were an ordinary couple, with their problems, ups and downs. We're just as messy and complex as any other couple, and we go through just as many changes, but I really respect her. Rima and I can sit in a room just reading and not saying anything to each other for an hour. Then she'll read something to me, and we'll both start giggling. Reflecting on how they managed to maintain the relationship, Rickman said, I think every relationship should be allowed to have its own rules. She's tolerant. She's incredibly tolerant. Unbelievably tolerant. Possibly a candidate for sainthood. The couple had no children. Rima made this decision once, and Alan accepted it with respect. To the annoying questions of journalists about children, he once replied, You should remember I am not the only one involved. There is another person here. I would have loved a family. Sometimes I think that, in an ideal world, three children, aged 12, 10, and 8, would be dropped on us, and we would be great parents for that family. However, Alan also admitted that the absence of children gave him a lot of career opportunities, and he could give his unspent love to his nieces. The actor liked to spend time with them at the first convenient opportunity. He took them to the movies, McDonald's, and of course, to toy stores. One time I told them we'd walk through Hamley's to choose one thing each. They marched straight to the Barbie counter. I couldn't believe it. Hideous little dolls with pointed legs and breasts. My sister doesn't dress them in pink or bows. However, if I had children, I'd like to think I'd let them wear whatever they wanted. None of my friends would believe me, but I'd let them walk down the road in pink lurex and gold plastic. In 2015, Alan Rickman surprised everyone 
with the news that he and Rima got married. Everything went quietly. No photos, wedding celebrations, and congratulations. We are married just recently. It was great because no one was there. After the wedding in New York, we walked across the Brooklyn Bridge and ate lunch. Rickman also added that he bought his wife a wedding band for 190 euros, but admitted that she never wears it. Unfortunately, they were not lucky enough to live in a marriage for a long time. In 2015, Alan Rickman was diagnosed with a terrible diagnosis, pancreatic cancer. Forecasts were disappointing. While he still had the strength, he tried to work and enjoy his life. Alan's last video work was related to charity. He helped Oxford University students raise money for Save the Children and Refugee Council. The actor voiced a 30-second video on YouTube. The advertising revenue received through numerous views was donated to charity. No one knew about his illness except the closest ones. Alan tried to have time to say goodbye to everyone who was dear to him. So the last thing we did together was change a plug on a standard lamp in his hospital room. The task went the same way as everything we have ever done together. I had a go. He told me to try something else. I tried. It didn't work. So he had a go. I got impatient. I took it from him. I tried it again. It still wasn't right. We both got slightly irritable. Then he patiently took it all apart again and got the right lead into the right hole. I screwed it in with a screwdriver. We complained about how fiddly it was. And then we had a cup of tea. It took us at least half an hour, this thing. And he said after as well, it's a good thing I decided not to become an electrician. Ian Rickson, who also met with Rickman in his last weeks of life, said that the actor furnished Rima a new home for her new life and carefully planned his own funeral, choosing people who, in his opinion, would be the most able to speak and sparing those for whom it might be too difficult. He thought about others until the last moment, so he left £100,000 for charity. $4 million was bequeathed to his beloved wife. Alan Rickman died on January 14th 2016 at the age of 69. On that day, the hearts of thousands of people around the world were broken. Those who were inspired by his work, his colleagues, and of course, those whom he supported, mentored, and loved. In a recent interview, when asked about future plans, he replied, God knows where I will be in 15 or 16 years. Well, wherever Alan is now, he will still live in our hearts. Always. I will carry the lessons he taught me for the rest of my life and career, Daniel Radcliffe wrote, and added that Alan Rickman is undoubtedly one of the greatest actors he has ever had to work with. We talk about the future life of other actors of the Potteriana, first of all, of course, the Golden Trio, in our other video. Click on the icon that appears on your screen and watch. Thank you for watching to the end. We will be grateful if you liked this video. It was Biographer with you. See you very soon.